Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today uh, to this webinar. Um, I'm particularly excited about uh, this webinar and the, and the topic, I think, is of special relevance, uh, at least in UK right now, uh, to the big importance of um, the um, high-speed uh, tool scheme. Um, the aim of today is to talk about uh, one particular problem for um, high-speed breaches, uh, that's uh, resonance and dynamic amplification and how we can uh, assess the dynamic behavior of, of the breach uh, using MIDAS. So the webinar is going to be structured like this. First, um, I will just uh, make a quick introduction about myself, uh, my company, Arcadis, and about the project of HS2. Uh, then I'm going to make an introduction on the problem that uh, we are going to talk about, this um, resonance and dynamic amplification how uh, this has been addressed in the Euro codes. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, two uh, key factors to consider, that's stiffness and mass. Um, the Egon value analysis and how to use it for this particular case. Then I'm going to jump to the how to set up a time history analysis. Um, the result interpretation from the results we get from this time history analysis, and finally, I will I will make a conclusion. Um, so my plan is I'm going to go with the webinar. If you have any questions, you can submit it at any time. But then I will aim to uh, respond them at the at the end of the webinar. Okay. So very quick introductions. Uh, about myself, I'm Pedro Faras. I'm a principal bridge engineer in Arcadius UK. I'm based in London. Um, I have more than 10 years of experience uh, designing bridges and, and civil structures. Um, I have an extensive experience in the use of finite element methods um, in structures. I've been involved many times in, in, in advanced analysis and complex structures, and I've been combining that with um, lecturing um, a finite element method in the um, civil engineering faculty in Barcelona for five years as well. Um, I've included here, here a few uh, projects that have been involved, uh, like the ESH, uh, the Ronald Motorway in Spain, uh, the High Speed Line uh, Feasibility Study in Poland, uh, in Saudi Arabia, um, I work with the Abbey Bakker Motorway and uh, Jada Metro. And probably the two biggest schemes uh, being developed in UK right now, that's the Lower Thames Crossing and obviously um, has been so. Um, about Arcadis, Arcadis is a, is a global company uh, with services that range from uh, design to consultancy, from natural assets to build assets. Um, proud to say that it has been chosen as Company of the Year by the New Civil Engineer Awards. Uh, we have more than 27,000 people around the world. Uh, we have over 300 offices and we are active in more than, than seven countries. Um, just to give some facts and figures, uh, our full year gross revenue was uh, 3.2 uh, billion euros last year. And in terms of breaches, uh, Cadiz has an, um, a very um, a long history and a, a lot of expertise in breaches. Um, our team um, here in UK is um, is around uh, 100 people. We are more than 350 uh, around the world. And, and we have been involved in, in, in bridges like um, the Milo Vaidet, couldn't resist to, to um, also uh, portray the tower bridge uh, that was uh, was designed by a former company of Arcadis many, many, many years ago. Uh, refurbishment of the Albert Bridge in London as well, the Rotherhide Bridge here as well, uh, the Terwara Bridge or the Vasco da Gama Bridge. Uh, so, um, yeah, we have a big team, a lot of expertise, and uh, uh, we love the technical challenges. Um, about uh, high speed, too. So, um, uh, probably you, you are already familiar with it, but just a very quick introduction. Uh, high speed two is because high speed, uh, high speed one uh, in UK is the line uh, that is currently in service connecting uh, the Euro Tunnel in London. So high speed two is uh, the pro project that is um, uh, being developed at the moment uh, to connect London, 
uh, to Birmingham, uh, Midlands, and then Manchester and Leeds. Um, our KDs is the lead uh, um, uh, designer um, with uh, working in joint venture with Zetek and Kowi for uh, the um, packages C2 and C3 of the phase one. Phase one is the, the, the first stretch that got from London to Birmingham. And packages C2 and C3, they are the central packages and it consists on uh, the line crossing um, um, uh, yeah, uh, mainland and uh, it has uh, above 80 kilometers of railway line, 86 bridges, 14 viaducts, and many other uh, major civil structures. Now that I have introduced um, the scheme, I'm going to introduce the problem. Uh, so what's this problem of resonance and dynamic magnification? Well, the classic approach of uh, designing bridges um, um, is to use um, static analysis uh, where you analyze forces, deflections in your in your bridge uh, under certain loading and if it's uh, a bridge uh, a rail bridge then, then you will use maybe a moving load to check different position on the train, but it's just a series of uh, static analysis that you are um, um, checking, you extract an envelope, and then you multiply by a factor, a dynamic amplification factor to um, to take into consideration the um, dynamic effects. And this classic approach uh, was the one that was used on the first uh, French high-speed line between Paris and Lyon. And um, when this line was uh, uh, put in service back in the 80s, um, some um, problems were observed in the line, in some of the bridges. So some bridges uh, exhibit some uh, resonance phenomena, and the ones that did, um, it was observed that the ballast uh, degraded very, very quickly. There was a rapid track deterioration and also that uh, short span structures were the ones uh, with more severe effects. Um, in view of that, uh, in a joint effort in Europe, uh, a committee was uh, constituted to uh, study uh, this problem. And uh, after running a series of studies and tests, uh, they concluded that uh, this, this problem is um, especially relevant for speeds, train speeds over 200 kilometers per hour. And for speeds over, the, over this, um, this value, uh, there is a high likelihood that you will have resonance effects. And if that happens, uh, using this classical approach of uh, doing a static analysis and then multiplying by a dynamic amplification factor, uh, that's unable to predict uh, the, the resonance effects. Um, and the other thing is that you need, uh, for these kind of bridges, you need to check the deck acceleration. Um, the committee as well established a series of rules and guidance for uh, doing the dynamic assessment of bridges, and these rules now have been implemented in the Eurocode. So what, what, what you see in the Eurocode is basically uh, the conclusion of this committee on this on this particular problem. Um, what is the difference between uh, when you have um, a line that is on ballasted track or a line that is on um, ballastless track? Well, uh, these problems of resonance and deterioration um, um, manifest in different ways. If you have ballast, uh, when the accelerations in your in your deck exceeds um, uh, 0.7 g, the, the acceleration of gravity. Then the grains in the ballast lock uh, lose uh, lose the interlock between the grains, and uh, they are not able um, to withstand uh, horizontal and vertical forces anymore. If they don't withstand these forces, they are not able to keep the sleepers and tracks in the on the on, on place, and that um, um, leads to have um, problems with the, with the track alignment and then quick deterioration and the risk of derailment. But if you're using uh, ballastless tracks, you don't have this problem with the, with the ballast, obviously. Uh, but, but when the acceleration exceeds um, the, um, the gravity acceleration, 
then uh, the contact between the real and the real is lost. And that also um, leads to a very quick deterioration of the track and as well to uh, the risk of the, the derailment. Uh, the committee also um, um, concluded that there is um, um, a big difference between single span structures and, and, and continuous structures. And um, continuous structures are able to reduce these resonance effects, but the single, uh, single span structures are the ones that are uh, severely affected. And they introduced as well the concept of resonance speed. And the resonance speed is the speed of the train that makes your um, uh, your bridge to go to resonance. And this speed doesn't necessarily have to be the high speed that your train can run over your um, uh, can run over your your bridge. Can be any speed between, uh, let's say, 200 kilometers per hour and the design uh, speed of the line. Now, um, how all this has been um, established on the on the on the Euro course. I'm going to do a very quick um, review on the provisions in the codes. So the first thing is about the dynamic uh, amplification factor. And the codes differentiate two different scenarios. One, when a dynamic analysis is not required, and another scenario when a, when a dynamic analysis is required. If it's not required, uh, you can go with the classical approach. Um, you check your structure with uh, moving loads, static moving loads, uh, with load model 71, model SW0, if appropriate you can use SW2. And uh, then the results from this static analysis you multiply by, by um, dynamic amplification factor. That is a value that you can uh, derive basically uh, um, with parameters of track irregularities and a determinant length that depends on the, on the element that uh, you are checking. If you are checking the main girders, it will have a determinant length. If you are checking some cross members, it will have another determinant length. And with that, uh, you are able to um, uh, design your bridge without having to do any dynamic analysis. But in some other cases, um, you do need to, to, to do a dynamic analysis. And if that's the case, you still have to um, uh, do your um, static analysis and apply uh, this uh, dynamic uh, amplification factor. But additionally, you have to run an, uh, another um, analysis, and uh, this is the dynamic analysis uh, with uh, different load models, uh, the HSLM, the high-speed load models, and uh, the real trend, uh, the trend that you're expecting to run uh, over your trucks. That's that's a real trend. And then uh, you have to multiply it by first uh, a value that is um, um, the um, amplification uh, of forces and deflections due to the dynamic behavior of your bridge. This is the uh, this first term over here. Um, and you have to multiply it by the maximum dynamic response. So you have to run um, a series of trains and a series of um, at a series of speeds, and you have to take the most onerous one and multiply um, the, result, the static results of these trains by this factor. And as well, you have to include an additional parameter for track defects and vehicle imperfections uh, in the equation. So we have these two scenarios when is required and when it's not required the dynamic analysis, but you might question now um, when how do I know if I need uh, dynamic analysis? Well, the codes give you a nice flowchart like this one. Um, I'm just uh, for the uh, sake of brevity, I'm um, adding here just one flowchart from the UK annex, and that's the one for simple structures. Uh, simple structures is the ones that um, behave like a beam element between supports. And there is another similar flowchart that is for complex structures that are the ones that have, do not behave as a, as a, as a beam uh, between supports, but they have, for instance, they have uh, grillage or orthotropic behavior or cable state or any more complex structures. You have to use uh, a different flowchart. Um, but this flowchart gives you um, um, some criteria to define if you will need or not uh, a dynamic analysis. Um, 
later on this webinar, I will introduce uh, a case study. And, and for this particular case, I'm going to show you how to use this flowchart and, 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 and determine um, if you need or not this dynamic analysis. Right. Um, the accelerations uh, check. Uh, we have said that if we need the dynamic analysis, we have to check uh, the maximum values for the dynamic uh, results, but we have to check acceleration as well. And which is uh, which are the limiting values that the, the code imposes? Well, uh, the code recommends a couple of values, uh, different values if you're uh, with a ballasted track or a ballastless track. Uh, if your track is on ballast, uh, the maximum acceleration that you can allow in your deck is 3.5 uh, meters per square second. And that's uh, to make sure that you don't have any problems with the stability of your ballast. Um, that's basically the 0.7G uh, that we have uh, seen uh, previously with a factor of two. Uh, if it's a ballastless track, um, then you should use a maximum acceleration of five uh, meters per square second. Uh, and in this case, it's for, to ensure that uh, your, um, the contact force between the wheel and the rail uh, doesn't reduce beyond acceptable limits. Um, but these two values are recommendations from the Eurocode and the UK annex from the Eurocode is, is, uh, tells you that um, these values uh, should be determined per, per specific uh, project. And another thing I think it's worth mentioning is uh, what we are talking here about is uh, this amplification uh, problem and uh, the problems with uh, uh, safety and track deterioration uh, if accelerations go beyond some limits. We're not talking about passenger comfort criteria. Uh, passenger comfort is covered somewhere, uh, somewhere else in the code. Okay, let's jump to now to uh, to main parameters for um, um, for our analysis. That's uh, stiffness and mass. Um, as you probably know, but uh, the, these these parameters are key for any uh, dynamic analysis that uh, you, you're going to perform. And in this case, um, uh, bridge stiffness, uh, you should consider this value very carefully. Because if you overestimate uh, the bridge stiffness, then you overestimate the fundamental frequencies of your bridge, and you will overestimate as well these resonance speeds. And you may miss resonance phenomena. You might be um, underestimating the, uh, the forces on your bridge, and um, that's put a risk in the safety of your bridge. Um, so it's very important that you um, uh, use a lower bound estimate of the, of the stiffness. Um, things like shear deformation, you have to make sure that you're considering shear deformation if you're using beam elements. Um, and if you're using concrete structures that um, you allow them uh, to crack by design, like a composite structure that you, uh, you, you expect um, the top slab to crack near the supports, you need to model the crack properties in your dynamic model. You cannot use cross properties because then you will uh, you will underestimate the, the the resonance effects. When we are talking about mass, um, then um, it gets a little bit, bit more complex um, uh, because you need to consider lower bound and upper bound of mass. The lower bound uh, will help you to estimate. Um, the maximum accelerations in your uh, in your bridge, um, and then when you're using the upper bound, uh, that's um, gonna um, help you to uh, define the lowest speeds that you can uh, get resonance uh, uh, in your bridge. So you have to uh, run two different scenarios with two different masses uh, to make sure that you're covering every possible situation. Um, for instance, in this upper and lower bound, when, when you have a ballasted track, uh, you have to consider two scenarios for the ballast. Uh, one scenario is when your um, thickness of ballast is the minimum allowable in your bridge, and the ballast is dry, and the ballast is clean, so it has a lower uh, density. And the other scenario is when you have um, 
um, an extra uh, thickness in your in your ballast uh, to allow for track lifts. So um, uh, thickness is is is, is greater, and then uh, you have to consider dirty um, ballast and with a saturated density. And these two different values is going to give you the two um, um, different bounds for your, for your for your mass. You also have to make sure that you're considering uh, masses for everything that goes on top of your bridge, and that's uh, the rails, sleepers, parapets, uh, overhead electrification, everything that um, will contribute to the, in the dynamic behavior of your bridge. Okay, so after this. Basic introduction. Uh, let me uh, introduce this case study. This is a case, a uh, very simple one that I think it's uh, useful for uh, understanding the basics of how to run this uh, dynamic uh, analysis. It's basically a 30 meters bridge, uh, single span, uh, concrete box uh, with the dimensions that I'm, 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 I'm showing right now. Um, so if we want to um, first check if we need a dynamic analysis and then um, um, analyze this uh, dynamic behavior, the first thing that we have to do um, is uh, go to this flowchart. And uh, you start by checking uh, the speeds. In this case, um, we are assuming that that's um, um, a bridge on a high speed line that uh, with speeds uh, up to uh, 400 kilometers per hour. Uh, so we have to go down. Um, we said that is a 30 meter single span bridge. Uh, so that's down again. And the next check that we have to do is that uh, we need to check if the fundamental frequency is within of the limits of the figure uh, of the national NH14. That's the figure that I just introduced here in the in the right hand side. Uh, so we need to assess this um, uh, fundamental um, fundamental modes and fundamental frequencies to see if we, we are within limits or not. So to do that, um, I've, pr I've prepared a model like this one, a very simple one. Uh, it's basically a beam element representing this concrete box, uh, 30 meter span. Uh, and I've subdivided uh, uh, the beam element with nodes every half a meter. Uh, my boundary conditions are simple supported in both sides. Uh, it's rotationally uh, fixed because I'm assuming that you have uh, we have a couple of bearings uh, at each support and the axle load is uh, fixed on one of the ends. Um, just to show more or less how it that looks like that's this section and that's a 30 meter um, uh, single supported span. Um, I've defined um, the section properties using uh, uh, this menu in in Midas when you have, can define the, the 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 uh the sizes for a concrete box. And it's very important that you make sure that uh, you tick this box to consider shear deformation to make sure that you're not overestimating the, the stiffness of your bridge. Um, I've also defined the material C45 with all the uh, parameters from the code. And um, then I've included first all the roads that I have on top of the bridge, ballast, um, sleepers, track, parapet, everything else, I've um, represented that as a, as, a, as a load. But since I have to run uh, an eigenvalue analysis, I converted that uh, to a mass by using lots to masses. So I'm converting every kind of load that I have. In this case, it's just a beam load. And uh, all the directions are important and a factor of one. So I have these loads for my um, these loads for my um, eigenvalue analysis will be considered as a mass. Uh, the other thing I have to make sure is that I'm considering um, the 
mass of my uh, concrete box and to do that you have uh, this menu in uh, structure and structure type and you have to make sure that you're ticking the to convert the self weight into masses and that's to be used in uh, three directions with that i have a model that has the stiffness properties and i have uh, boundary conditions and i have the mass properties uh, so you should be ready to run a dynamic analysis uh, sorry uh, eigenvalue analysis uh, to get the fundamental modes if you do that uh in results mode shades variety mode shades you can ch just check which are your results for instance for the first mode you'll have something like that that that's uh, vertical bending uh i just change it a little bit so something like that mode number two that's um horizontal bending that's uh, uh, the view from the top of the bridge and you can see how the uh, this mod makes the bridge bend uh, laterally um, mod number three oh what happened here well if you're checking these results you will see that uh, my is not uh, showing any displacement but the fact that the truth is um, now you cannot see that on this window but I'm going to show that uh here in the presentation um the third mode that's this mode over here um this has a mass participation factor of 80 percent in x rotation in x direction and that's torsion so this uh, you have you have to be very be very careful to identify the, the, these kind of modes, uh, so you don't think that is a uh, mode that is not relevant. Uh, but this actually is very relevant. It's the first torsional mode of the structure, uh, mode number three. Okay, and you uh, continue extracting all the results until you you you, you get a table uh, a table like this one. Um, uh, you may wonder how many modes do I need for uh, my analysis? Well. Uh, the euro codes give you some recommendations and it's telling you that you have to uh, extract as many modes as uh, up to thir uh, 30 hertz uh, or 1.5 times uh, the frequency uh, of the first fundamental mode of the member that you are designing if it's a main girder so the uh, vibration of this member but if it's a cross member or if it's a, a cantilever or another another secondary member you have to consider the fundamental frequency for this specific member or uh, at least uh, three vibration modes uh, for the member that you're designing um, in this case uh, we are just um, um, we have this main member that's that uh, that is acting as a beam because it's a very simple structure this uh, concrete box uh, so I run up to uh, 30 hertz so I extract up to five uh, five different modes and if I use these results in my flow chart uh, this was when we end up before uh, in this uh, check here and we needed to check if the fundamental mode was within uh, the limits of the figure 14 and we have a bridge of 30 meters that's this value over here uh, the first fundamental frequency was 6 hertz that is a value here so we see that um, we are within limits so fine we can go down and continue in the flow chart next check is uh, to check if the torsional uh, the first torsional frequency is greater than 1.2 the first pending uh, fundamental frequency and if we go back to uh, our results we see that the first pending uh, frequency was 6 the first uh, torsional was 20 much greater than 1.2 times the, the pending one so that's a yes uh, we can continue right uh, is skew less than 15 in this case uh, skew um, uh, is zero so we continue uh, and uh, the code is telling you that you may use only uh, the bending mode for your uh, dynamic analysis uh, but definitely a dynamic analysis is required but, uh, for this kind of structure um, in uh, 
this recommendation saying that you may use only the bending modes, uh, you will see later on that I will use bending and torsional modes because for me it's uh, almost as uh, easy to use uh, all the modes that I have already instructed that just picking the ones that are bending. Uh, so that's why it just says may not, you, shall, you must use, it says that it's optional to use only the bending modes. Right, so conclusion. Uh, we need to run a dynamic analysis. Uh, so how we do that? Well, um, first, which kind of time history analysis we need to run? Uh, it's a linear or is it non-linear analysis? Well, uh, usually the structures that you will be designing, uh, you will expect the structure to behave uh, in, on the linear range when you're applying the live load. So you should suspect that you will uh, um, analyze the structure for uh, within the linear range. Um, it's not explicitly uh, said in the codes, but uh, the assumption is that you will uh, use a model integration uh, uh, method uh, because uh, that allows you to pick the modes that are relevant as I just um, um, seen on the on this flow chart. And uh, the other thing, that's, that's, that's a transient problem. It's not a periodic problem because obviously you have to train, runs over, uh, over your bridge and then uh, goes away and uh, there is no load on, on top of your train. Right, so these are the main um, uh, characteristics, characteristics of your time history analysis. What else? Uh, time step, which time step we should uh, use? Well. Uh, for the time step, there, you, there is not um, any recommendation in the codes, uh, in the in the Euro codes. But uh, the report that uh, this committee uh, prepared, um, uh, that I've already introduced before, uh, gives a series of recommendations uh, of which is the maximum time step uh, that you should use, uh, and you should use the, the minimum time step of these four values. Uh, that uh, yeah, this formula depends on the frequencies that you have extracted from your eigenvalue analysis, um, the span of your bridge, the fundamental frequency, and well, the last of them all is that you shouldn't use um, you shouldn't use a time step that is over one millisecond. Uh, why is that important? Well, it is important. I've just added a figure here. Uh, in this figure, I'm just trying to. Um, um, describe um, a response of a, of a structure. And I've run two different analyses. One with a time step of um, um, five milliseconds. Uh, that's the blue line. And you can see that uh, is uh, describing quite well how the this structure oscillates and has a peak value of around one. And then I have the same uh, problem, but I have, this, uh, I have chosen to use a time step of 40 milliseconds instead, and that's the red line. If I do that, you will see that then the amplitude of the oscillation I'm extracting from this result uh, is reduced significantly. Actually, that's around half uh, of the amplitude of the first analysis. So I'm underestimating the uh, peak values by, uh, by, ha by, by, by half. And that's why it's very important to uh, to, to choose the, the appropriate time step. Um, another parameter that we need to know uh, to uh, set up this time history analysis is stamping, and the Eurocode gives you some recommendations. Um, and the damping values depends on uh, the span of your bridge and depends on if it's uh, steel, of its composite, a pristess concrete, of its reinforced concrete. Um, and the last thing is uh, the loads that we uh, we should use. Then the euro codes introduce you on different uh, different loads. Um, the first set of loads is for um, doing this uh, acceleration check and uh, extracting the dynamic amplification factor. And uh, there are different uh, load models. The first load model is uh, HSLM A. That is a set of 10 different variations of a um, uh, load model like the, the one that is on the figure here. And basically it's a series of coaches with axle loads um, and uh, the variations is because 
you, um, you can change the values of axle spacing, the length of your coach, and the number of coaches that you're going to use. The purpose of having these 10 variations is to cover all possible situations, all possible um, uh, trains running over your, over your bridge. For uh, simple structures and spans less than seven meters, you have another uh, load model, that's SLMB. And the other load model that you have, that you have to run is a real train. Um, as I said, this is for uh, the acceleration check and for uh, getting this uh, dynamic amplification factor. Uh, but another thing that you have to do is a fatigue check. And for that, uh, the codes give you different um, load models, 12 different trains that you have to run on top of your bridge, and how you have to uh, mix this, um, these trains and how frequently they run over your, uh, over your, over your bridge. And all these different load models, you have to run them uh, over your bridge at the different speeds, trying to catch up this resonance speed. And speeds, according to the code, have to go from 40 meters per second, that's roughly 140 kilometers per hour, up to 1.2 times the maximum line speed. Uh, in the high speed zone, we are considering a maximum line speed of 400 kilometers per hour. So that means that we need to run uh, this dummy history analysis for speeds up to 480 kilometers per hour. Right, so we have these train models. Um, and the question now is how we can introduce these uh, train models to, to the dynamic analysis. Well, um, this um, these load models will be basically axles moving from uh, on top of your bridge. And here I have an example of uh, one axle load. This is this uh, load over here that is on top of uh, one of the nodes on your bridge, uh, assuming that you have modeled that as a beam element, and, but it's the same thing for uh, any other element. And that um, this load starts moving when uh, uh, the time is in, um, uh, passes, goes uh, most forward to the next node uh, until it gets just on top of the next node. Um, then we don't have uh, a way of introducing uh, uh, loads as such as that. Well, um, we can transform these moving loads to uh, loads in nodes that are increasing and decreasing depending on the position of the axle. So if the axle is on the first node, we'll have a 100% of the axle force on the first node. If the axle is between the two uh, nodes, then uh, we will use just half of the axle force in the first node and half of the uh, axle uh, load in the, in the next node. And until the axle moves to the next node and then the first node will have zero force and the next node will have the full axle force. And this, um, is represented as, as, as these time functions. So it's a time function that is a uh, value of f when uh, the time uh, is equal to j and when time starts to increment is, is going down, down until the axle is on top of the next node and then this is zero. This is for the next, uh, for the first node, node i, and for the next node i plus one, it's a very similar function, but it starts with zero and it starts increasing and increasing and increasing until the axle is just on top of this node, and then you have for 100% uh, of the force applied. So this way allows you um, to uh, transform what is a moving load to uh, um, dynamic nodal loads. Okay, that's for one axle. What happens when you have a series of axles? That's, that's your um, load models from the Eurocodes. Well, if we are trying to get a time function for this first node for a full train, uh, and we run the train on top of your uh, bridge, and every time that axle just steps over your node, you will have one of these peaks here. Um, that uh, stands for the first node. What happens if we, you want to extract the, the, the time function for another node? Well, uh, the time function is exactly the same. 
but with a delay uh, compared with the with the first time function. This delay is just the time that uh, takes the train to um, get from the first node in the bridge to uh, the pro node. Okay, so with uh, all these, you have all the information you need to set up uh, a time history analysis. So what I'm going to do is go back to my model and I'm gonna start setting up this uh, time history um, load case. So first thing in uh, loads, dynamic loads and load cases, you will, you're gonna set up um, um, your time history load case. So I'm gonna call it test. I'm gonna run this test train at 300 kilometers per hour. As we said, this is a linear case, um, uh, model integration and is a transient problem. Um, the time increment is uh, one millisecond and the damping ratio, if you check the codes for a bridge test concrete structure, is 1%. Right, with this, um, you have set your load case. Next thing is um, to set up, um, to describe the time function. And then we go to load again and time history functions and add time function. And then I'm gonna create a time function under the same name test train at 300 kilometers per hour. I want to be that the time function that describes a force. And then we want to use this uh, graph uh, that we have just shown in the presentation. I want to introduce that to uh, my model. So how we can do that? Well, what I've done is I've prepared an, an, an Excel spreadsheet uh, that takes um, every uh, load model and uh, transforms it uh, to a time history function uh, using the train speed, using the spacing between nodes, and obviously the train model. So if you change here, you want to use, for instance, HSLM A5. Uh, this time uh, function for the whole train is going to change. Uh, if you want to use another speed, then everything will be updated for this uh, different speed. Or also uh, the spacing between nodes, you want to use another spacing, then uh, that will change the, uh, the time that takes the train to go from one node to the other. Uh, for this case, to make it brief, I'm going to use a test model. My spacing was half a meter and I was um, um, aiming to have 300 kilometers per hour uh, train speed. Uh, so I have this kind of time function, the one that is plotted here, and the values are just in this table here. So what I'm going to do is just copy these values in my um, MIDAS model. I'm going to first prepare the rows, which is just inserting arbitrary values, so I can just then copy and paste. Right, so you can see here that you have the time function uh, that we had on the Excel spreadsheet as well. So we have the time function. Fine, we have the time history load case, we have the time functions. What else? Well, next thing to do is the dynamic nodal loads. Uh, how are they described in MIDAS? Well, um, first uh, they're um, assigned to a specific load case. This is the test uh, at 300 kilometers per hour. Fine, this is the one that we want to run. Uh, then they are assigned to a specific uh, time function. And this is the one that we just described, and that's a uh, time function for a force, so fine. And this force uh, is going to be in Z direction. And um, it's going to be with a factor of minus one because it's going to point uh, downwards. Um, Right, 
and which nodes should we should apply? We have this uh, this factor, and there is another factor, another um, value that we have to uh, insert. That's the arrival time, and the arrival time is uh, the time that uh, uh, happens between uh, your structure analysis and when your time function starts applying to your node, and that's this delay that we have uh, introduced before. This delay between uh, the first node and the node that you're considering. Uh, so, to do that, what I'm going to do first is just let all my nodes and assign them uh, this dynamic nodal uh, load case with an arrival time of zero, and then I will update that uh, in a tabular format because it's just easier for me. If you go to tables and you go to static loads and dynamic nodal loads, you have all this information in a tabular data. And uh, uh, in my spreadsheet, I have this arrival time as well. So I'm going to use that so I can just copy my arrival time into my MIDAS model. Like that. Okay. So for the first node, arrival time obviously is zero because the first, the train starts uh, here when the, the, the analysis starts. Uh, second node, uh, well, you cannot see it for, um, uh, because uh, there is only two digits, but it takes um, six milliseconds to reach the second node, 12 milliseconds to reach the third node, etc. Right? So we have everything in your model. Now you can just close, uh, and if all your inputs are right, you can just run the analysis and you will get the results. Um, okay. Uh, I'm gonna jump, jump back to the uh, presentation now and uh, go into the next section, that's results interpretation. That's very important for a couple of reasons. The first is that you want to make sure that your analysis uh, is right. And secondly, because you need to uh, be careful when extracting the results, so you're getting the peak values for forces, deflections, and accelerations. Um, for instance, for this case study, the, the model that we are performing, uh, we can extract values as, as envelopes. I'm going to show that directly in our model, um, just for being quick. I just have the same model with uh, all the different trains and different speeds already uh, analyzed, so I have the results ready, so you don't have to wait um, the time that takes uh, the model to run all these different cases. So what you can do is just go, for instance, if you want to check uh, accelerations for a specific um, uh, load case, you can go to deformations, the form shape, and when you're checking the results here, you will notice that you have uh, all the different time history analysis uh, similar to when you are running envelopes. You have uh, maximum values, minimum values on all the values for uh, this uh, time history load case, the A1 at uh, 180 kilometers per hour. So, for instance, if you want to check the peak acceleration values for the load model A1 at 300 kilometers per hour, uh, I need to check this lot uh, case, absolute acceleration, I'm interested in all directions, fine. Uh, I'm just gonna click on values and I click OK. So this is the envelope of accelerations. And for this specific load case, for this speed and this train, uh, the maximum, the peak acceleration value is not at mid-span as you may, uh, I think that's the um, uh, obvious case, but in this case it's at this now that's one third uh, of the length. Uh, so that's node number 21. Another thing that you have uh, you can do to extract results is instead of uh, uh, getting the envelopes for a specific load case, you can um, use um, a time history graph. Uh, so it's going to give you for a specific node, I've selected the node 21, specific uh, output, in this case is acceleration in Z direction, and for a specific load case, in this case is uh, the train A1 at 300 kilometers per hour, I can just plot the results. And this is how uh, the acceleration looks like uh, plotted against time. So it starts at zero, obviously, and starts oscillating in a forced um, um, vibration and 
somewhere here, five, five point something seconds, the train um, leaves the deck, and then you have free oscillation of the deck, and since you have a damping value, it, this fades away. And it's very important that you check this kind of graphs because you want, want to make sure that you have run the model long enough uh, to capture all the time that the train is on top of your bridge. It's when you will have the peak values. If you just run this model for two seconds, maybe you're missing one uh, peak value here at four point something seconds when the train is still on top of your bridge. Right. Uh, you can plot that as frequencies as well, uh, and that will help you to understand which frequencies are more excited and if that makes sense to you. Usually, uh, lowest frequencies means uh, uh, you need less energy to um, um, uh, excitate the, um, uh, the motion of your bridge, so they usually are the ones that uh, have greater contributions. If you look at, uh, look at that and you have everything um, zero for the first frequency and you have then you have a frequency uh for the mode number 80 that is um contributes to the whole um um vibration then uh maybe something is wrong maybe it's fine but it's worth it you you're, you're checking that if, if the results make sense right uh another thing that you can do is extract results as a video uh also helps you to see how the um train uh, your your bridge behaves uh, in this this is not the same load uh, the, the study case this is a multi-span bridge but I thought that was interesting to see how the uh, the load moves along the bridge and then um, you can see all the flexions it's useful as well to see if there any, uh, you have any spurious results and there is something wrong you will spot it very quickly in the, in the video all right and last but not least um you need to plot a uh, big acceleration uh for all the different speeds for train number for the train model a1 i've done that and then i see that for speeds from 140 to 300 it's not a big deal maybe i have uh yeah a speed around here that makes uh a, a, more magnification of the of, of the acceleration, but I really have a resonance speed around 395 kilometers per hour over here. Um, I have to do that for train A1, but for all the, uh, the different trains as well, up to A10, and then you will notice that the uh, resonance speed changes depending on the train. For instance, for the train A10, this is a resonance speed around 300 instead of 395. Uh, in this case, uh, we have assumed that it is a ballasted track, uh, so quickly you can see that the maximum acceleration is beyond the limit. The limit is 3.5 over here, so we are fine. There is no uh, safety problems uh, with uh, track deterioration or derailment. You need to also to check uh, other outputs like uh, every uh, force and the flexion that you need to check uh, your bridge. You have to check your uh, dynamic results and see if they are most onerous rather than your static load case. Uh, so what you can do is plot uh, the dynamic results against speeds like this. This is the bending moment at mid-span. Um, and then in the same graph, plot the results for the static analysis multiplied. This is static analysis multiplied by uh, the dynamic amplification factor. So in this specific case, um, this um, static cloud case and, the, and this factor is most onerous, so you can use that for designing your bridge. In, in other situations, uh, your dynamic results might be most onerous, then you have to use them for, uh, for to design your bridge. Okay, so I'm already hitting my hour, so I'm gonna be concluding now. Um, so resonance and dynamic magnification, um, it's very important to understand that it's especially relevant for speeds over 200 kilometers per hour, so high speeds, uh, and that short span structure are particularly prone to this uh, to this problem. I know, um, I've had discussions with uh, colleagues that uh, asking me, well, should we should I worry about my 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 bridge? It's it's a very 
tiny bridge, uh, very short span. Uh, so I don't think that, that 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 can be a problem for the for my bridge. Well, you, you have to think just the opposite. If it, if it's a tiny bridge or a small bridge and it's a single span and it's simple support, then it's really uh, susceptible of having this problem. Uh, the resonance speed, um, it's difficult to anticipate the resonance speed uh, for most structures. I'm saying that because if you have a single span um, structure, you can use it, you can use um, analytical formulas, but when you have um, the change on stiffness uh, along the, the bridge, or you have a brillage model, orthotropic, or any or more complex bridge, uh, it's very difficult to get any feeling of which is the resonance speed unless you run this dynamic analysis. And to really capture with this resonance speed, you need to run a series of um, analysis at the different speeds, like uh, 140, 150, 160, and then identify uh, which are the areas with um, um, more resonant results uh, with uh, greater uh, amplitude and then refine uh, the, the speed step over this area to get the resonance speed. Uh, model property is very important to check very carefully, mass and stiffness and use up, uh, upper and lower bounds. Uh, the analysis, uh, you have to take into account that that requires uh, numerous time history cases. If you have like 10 trains for 1A to 110 and you have to run it from 140 to 480 kilometers per hour every, let's say, 10 kilometers per hour. That's a huge amount of load cases to run, like 400 different uh, time history load cases. Every time history load case uh, takes a while, so 400 of them takes much more. Um, and uh, last thing, result interpretation is very important. If you carefully check your results, make sure that they make sense and then that you're capturing these uh, resonance bits and the peak values so you are designing your bridge to the uh, most onerous effects. Okay, uh, that was all for today. Uh, hope you enjoyed the, the webinar. Um, you can, um, I, I will try to respond some, I see that there are some of the questions, some questions now, we try to respond them. Uh, but if, if you have further questions, you can always contact um, Midas at the Global Support website or, 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 this, or, this, or this address over here. So let me check which questions we have. Uh, first question says, um, Fundamental frequency is not within limits of the figure of 14, and therefore dynamic analysis is not required. Let me check this out, but it should be within limits. Maybe I haven't said that is which are the limits. Yeah, so this is where we have our um, 30 meter span bridge and 6.1 hertz, and it should be within these limits, this one and this one. So if that's within limits, then um, um, we should continue like this way. If it's not within limits, then we need to agree with the relevant authority. If they agree to continue with this design, we need to uh, change something in our design. Next question is, in MIDAS, when entering material properties, you can apply damping ratios to the materials. You can also apply model damping when considering time history loads. How are each of these applied and should uh, both be considered or is it one preferred? Um, well, um, in the bridges I've been considering, uh, they are, um, or, um, uh, concrete, uh, pre-stressed concrete boxes or composite steel structures. Uh, so I'm using the values uh, from the codes and that's basically these values over here. So I'm using an overall damping ratio for my analysis of 0.5% uh, if it's a composite structure of 1% if it's a pre-stressed concrete. Um, but depending on the kind of structure that you're working on, you, you may consider using different uh, damping ratios for different materials. That actually is up to you, and depending on, on, on the kind of structure. Um, 
which structural damping is better to be considered for dynamic analysis, um, model damping or mass and stiffness proportional damping, Riley damping. Uh, will there, there are considerable difference in response based on the damping method chosen? Uh, my experience is when you are designing a bridge that you don't have any um, uh, monitoring results of a structure, you will uh, not have uh, values that allows you to differentiate between uh, which um, uh, damping ratio can be applied to mass and which one is applied to stiffness. And the codes uh, give you these values that is for uh, um, model damping. So that's the ones uh, generally things that should be used for a, a new structure. Uh, another situation if you are assessing a bridge that you are able to uh, monitor and then you can assess um, which are the damping ratios for mass and stiffness, uh, then you can just uh, use um, uh, the, these values from the, um, from, the, from the monitoring that probably are more accurate than, than these ones over here. Um, next question. Uh, can you please explain the difference between model and direct integration? Yes, uh, sorry I couldn't go more in deep with that, but um, model integration, what uh, you do basically is extract a certain uh, modes uh, from your eigenvalue analysis and then um, yeah, you use a superposition of these modes uh, and and to see how your loads um, excitate these different modes, the mo the, your loads are, are transformed to um, um, uh, to oscillations um, um, before you transforms, and then um, you can um, all the loads are uh, just transformed to uh, what is the contribution to every every different frequency. Uh, the good thing about doing that is, is less time consuming than the time integration and um, uh, for linear analysis um, that's uh, yeah that's uh, a common way of, of using it. Uh, time, time integration means that uh, you just check the, uh, the balance equations uh, at, and um, you solve uh, the stiffness and mass matrix at every, every time step. Uh, and that means that you can consider any kind of analysis, linear, nonlinear, uh, any kind of properties. So it gives you more flexibility on how you consider an, um, uh, your model. Um, the problem with that is since you have to run uh, one analysis for every, every time step and you, you, you um, for instance, if you are using um, one second of overall time and one millisecond as a time step, that's uh, 1,000 steps. That means running 1,000 analysis, very time consuming. And the other problem is with the time step, uh, the errors can propagate uh, much more easily than the um, um, than the model superposition. So uh, with time integration, you should go to even smaller time steps to avoid any um, numerical problems. Uh, but the model superposition is much more stable. Uh, in this kind of analysis, usually uh, model superposition uh, is used first because you're, you're gonna, uh, you want to choose which modes to use in your analysis. Second, because it's more, much more stable. And, sec and, and, and the third thing is because it's less time consuming. Uh, another question, what other finite element solvers are able to run this type of analysis other than MIDAS? Is LUSAS an option? Uh, I'm not familiar with LUSAS, uh, I'm sorry about that. I know that all the solvers are able to run this kind of analysis, um, yes. Um, I mean, is really you can check to uh, uh, the software provider in and, and see if they can run uh, model superposition um, uh, model superposition time history analysis and then if they do then then uh, this uh, this kind of model can can be done um, will it be possible to circulate the excel spreadsheet used in the presentation um, 
I'm not sure about it. It's not because I don't want to share it, but uh, when you share this kind of uh, information, then you have responsibility uh, that the spreadsheet is robust, watertight, and doesn't have any glitch or anything else. Rather, and this is a spreadsheet that I've prepared for myself, and I'm working with um, uh, when I'm working with these kind of problems. Uh, the truth is. Um, it's not uh, difficult to prepare one uh, by yourself. Um, that probably matches better your workflow. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, Miders is preparing as well uh, some um, additional tools to, to run this kind of analysis. So it will be implemented in future versions. You, you can um, also uh, always contact them for, for, for this. Um, you spoke about underestimating the time step. Can you speak about overestimating it? Uh, I understand that overestimating it is like saying I'm going to be safe, so I'm going to use 0.1 milliseconds for my analysis. Um, well, it's not harmony. It's, uh, you can use 0.1 or even um, uh, less than that. The only problem is the smaller the time step, the longer will take to run the analysis and uh, the size of your uh, output files is going to increase exponentially. So we, you have to be careful. My recommendation is for a specific structure, uh, get your model ready, uh, run just one train at one speed, and make sure that you're uh, getting nice results. Do a sensitivity study, try to reduce, then try to increment the time step, See if that has a relevant effect. When you're happy with it, then run the uh, the, the other uh, uh, route cases. What's your opinion on the slab track versus ballast track debate for HS2? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm in a position to uh, respond to that. Uh, obviously, there is an, in, an implication for this kind of analysis. Um, um, and, 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 and this problem. But as far as uh, you are using the um, the codes and you're making sure that your accelerations are uh, below these limits uh, for ballasted tracks and for ballast stress tracks, you should be fine. So I understand um, that um, uh, the, the debate is somewhere else. Okay. Uh, that's all for today. Hope that you have enjoyed the the, um, uh, the webinar. As I said, if you have further questions, sorry, I cannot respond any more questions. Uh, you can always contact me, or you can contact Midas at the Global Support website uh, shown on screen, or you can contact uh, via email at uksupport.midasuser.com. Thank you for joining.